Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. Today, I've got Adam Goldman on the show for the past nine years. Get this, guys. He's been a top franchise coach and consultant. Adam's helped hundreds of people change their lives through franchise business ownership. He helps others find not only the right franchise, but also the right opportunity in their specific area. This is allowing them to help build their dreams. Adam's latest book, The Franchisee Lifestyle, demystifies the world of franchising, and it provides valuable insight to educate readers on the key factors that can make or break a franchise deal. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brandon. Dude, so drive around and you know you you see Jimmy John's and you see McDonald's, you see all these franchises out there, and I've got so much that I want to ask you today on like how this whole franchising world works. Before we jump into that, give the audience your backstory. So I'm actually a real estate investor as well, right? I own a portfolio of single family residences that I bought after 2008 uh, that are bank owned, that are owner financed. And I found in 2009, 2010, that the deals were kind of drying up. And so I said to my friend, I'm like, hey, you know, maybe I should do a franchise. And so he introduced me to a coach. Uh, I invested in a Vanguard cleaning master franchise in Houston. Um, I didn't realize that I'd be cleaning toilets for a living, but that ended up being the way it was and built it up from scratch and uh, realized that around along the way that this is great. And uh, But I kind of realized I really kind of wanted to help people kind of have the same experience that I had with finding the right fit. So started franchise consulting uh, part-time, um, started it about eight or nine years ago. And then what happened was uh, it was a situation where someone came to me with an unsolicited offer to actually purchase my Vanguard cleaning franchise. So started doing this part-time just by accident and just found that I really, really like this. I like helping people. And since the pandemic, uh, people have just been more excited about going out on their own and having side income or side hustles. And so I'm actually three or four times busier than I was before the pandemic. So you had a, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a cleaning business that was a franchise? Is that right? That's correct. Have you ever heard of Jenna King before? I have not. So that's okay. It was an office cleaning master franchise for the Houston area. And okay. what happened is that I had different uh, buildings that were accounts and I had franchisees or sub-franchisees that were the ones that were cleaning those accounts along with their employees. So it was a really good avenue into the franchising world. I actually owned that for eight and a half years. Wow. All right. So how was this structured? Walk me through. It was a it was a cleaning franchise. And, you know, how how many employees did you have? What was your involvement? Maybe if you can speak to maybe some like net revenues, net profit, because I'm very curious, like cleaning is like very, very niche. Yep. So it was a multi-million dollar business, right? Um, only three or four employees, right? Which is fascinating, right? So it was the I wasn't the one cleaning the accounts. Um, I was finding franchisees along with their franchise uh, around with their employees that would clean the accounts, right? Uh, and I would actually get paid a percentage of uh, the cleaning revenue, uh, meaning because I did all the billing for them, and I also got paid to find accounts for them as well. Uh, so it was an interesting business model. Now, one of the challenges of that model, frankly, is it's a very competitive model, and we're not talking about the same sort of margins that you might have with Microsoft. Right. Yeah, so yeah, pretty cleaning. small margins, unfortunately, which was challenging. Um, yeah. So. OK, so it sounds like you had outsourced a lot of the operations to, uh, you know, franchisees that would then go and actually do like the actual hands on cleaning then. That's correct. Got it. And then but obviously someone reached out to you and wanted to buy it. So, I mean, it had to be worth something. Absolutely. It was a good exit. Yeah. Good. Well, what does it cost to start a franchise in this this new world that we're in? So Brandon, I get asked this question all the time. How expensive is it? And so yeah. the franchise brands have a requirement that people have at least $50,000 in cash and $150,000 in assets. Now there are different financing uh, portfolios or, or financing methods, right? You could get uh, some sort of a loan. Uh, it might be some sort of a bank loan or, or sometimes there's financing from the franchise or uh, you also could potentially use your 401k as well. But we talk about how expensive franchises are. Let's talk about the universe of franchises. So yeah. brick and mortar franchises, if you buy a McDonald's, it's millions of dollars. On the lower end for brick and mortar retail, if you have a smaller type of gym, 
that's boutique that has a small footprint, 500, 1,000 square feet, that might be about $200,000 all in. Uh, non brick and mortar businesses, which by the way, have become very popular since the pandemic. Things, I'm not saying that I would connect you with this, Brandon, or, or a listener with this, but if you're in Houston, and you have a lot of mosquitoes, a mosquito spraying franchise is an interesting way to kind of start something very inexpensively. So that might be $125,000 all in. Uh, and, then, and then the non brick and mortar businesses go up from there. It sounds like this would be something that would ease, potentially easily get financed from a bank if you're looking for a loan to start it because you've got the business model that's proven. I'm just you know thinking out loud that, hey, if I'm going to a bank and I'm trying to buy a McDonald's, they're like, oh, my God, it's McDonald's, right? I mean, the business model has been proven. Is that what you've seen? Absolutely. So my experience is that because you have a proven business model, the funding uh, percentage approval is much higher. In fact, I don't think I've ever had a situation where someone has the right sort of credit score uh, doesn't get financed. Interesting. Okay, so the financing is pretty easy. All right, so this is a pretty low barrier to entry. You, you've got to have at least 50 grand, uh, at least $150,000 in assets. Now that $50,000, is that what as an average franchises want their franchisees to to invest in, or is this just liquid cash that they want them to have sitting on the sidelines? So great question. Look, they want to have people to have a cushion, right? But just like my experience is that if people are getting financing, let's say it's a $200,000 or $150,000 franchise, it's typically a situation where you might finance $100,000 and then pay $50,000 out of your pocket. Kind of like buying a house, right? Where you're spending 20 or 30% out of pocket. Got it. So they want to make sure that they've got some skin in the game per se yeah. down payment to actually run the operations. So we were kind of chit and chatting before this because I was kind of curious. You told me that there were over 75 industries that these franchises operate in. So obviously it is all across the board. I mean, that's that's pretty much every single industry right there. What have you noticed between the people that go this route? and invest in franchises that are successful versus the ones that are not? Such a great question. I mean, look, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you're looking at IT, right? The question is, is it a is it user error, right? Let's think Y2K, or is it some sort of system malfunction? I would argue that the vast majority of failures that I've seen is user error. I've had people that are uh, white collar, people that have bought blue collar franchises, right? I've had situations where it kind of things are outside of their control. The person that buys a gym in February of 2020 with not enough cushion right before the pandemic, that's really an uh, unfortunate situation, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's it, a lot of times a situation where people just aren't willing to put in the work, right? Or not listening to what the franchisor says. Um, that's what I found the vast majority of cases, the things that work out. Okay, so it's you boiled down the two things: not doing the work or not wanting to listen to what the franchisor says. But tell me more about that. Like, what specifically are they not doing? I guess besides just not doing the work that the franchisors are asking of them or advising. Great question. I mean, when you buy a franchise, Brandon, you're buying a brand name, yeah. right? But you're also buying a system, right? And so let's talk about this, right? Like, let's say that you buy a McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they tell you where to put it together. They should give you this playbook, how to hire people, uh, the whole process of hiring. Imagine if you tried opening a McDonald's and you didn't even use the playbook. You found the real estate on your own. It was in a bad yeah. place. Uh, you decided not to use the McDonald's handbook and you uh, overstaffed. And now all of a sudden you're in the hole. Uh, you decided to sell gyros as opposed to hamburgers. Uh, just all these, there's so many different ways that you can kind of go off the, the reservation or, or go off path. So it's literally just not following the path that's, that's laid out before them. Exactly. Yeah, it's like, like somehow thinking you know better. In fact, what I would say, Brent, I don't mean to interrupt you. I, the great thing about franchising is one of the most interesting things in that you they actually, it's a positive thing to not have any experience. I specifically have brands that are looking for the majority of them, people that don't have any experience, they can teach them how to do it their way at Hamburger University, wherever that might be. Yeah, it's like a you ask a billionaire, and he's like, how do I become a billionaire? And he lays out this very clear path to what you need to do step by step, and you look at it and you go, I don't want to work that many hours. I don't I don't want to hire all those people. I don't want to spend 30 years doing something over and over and over and over and over again to, to perfect it. Like, ah, I'm good. And so it's, it's that classic case of people just not wanting to put the work in. I'm curious on 
these franchise opportunities, what – let me see how to word this right here. When you're working with somebody who's you know wanting to get into this, do you advise them to go into the same kind of background that they've got so they come in with some familiarity? Where it's you know it's like um, it's like some of the best advice I ever got was like don't invest in things you don't understand, right? You know Warren Buffett he does the same thing. That's why he missed out on the tech boom. But what you just said, I want to make sure I can clarify because it sounded like what you're saying is the franchises really like people that don't have that background because they can come in with sort of a clean slate and train them to do things the way they want to do them. What I'm kind of asking is to me in my world, if I'm going to go and pick a franchise out, I, you know, I might be a little bit more inclined to maybe go and, and do some kind of um, uh, like real estate opportunity or, you know, maybe some kind of like uh, maybe a development company, right? Because that's what we do, like something like that, because I have that background. It, it, but which one are you recommending? That's a great question. I mean, look, I'll give you an example. My cousin, he's a it's a non-franchise bakery. He likes baking, right? But he doesn't like being up, uh, waking up at two o'clock in the morning uh, to bake bread, right? So- yeah. Uh, and he has a background in that. A business is business, right? So if you're a great operator or business person and you have a background in real estate, yes, maybe you'll invest in a property management franchise. But what I tell my candidates is don't rule out a really hot fitness concept or something else that's kind of outside of your wheelhouse just because you haven't done it before. If it has high margins, the top people that I work with are ones that kind of have an open mind towards things. Um, so there is some value in something that's kind of familiar to you. But at the uh, same token, from the same token, maybe you probably don't want to pay franchise fees for something that you know already. Okay, I see. So you're thinking it makes more sense if you're you know, looking maybe as a diversification play into like another industry and that you can come in and diversify. And you've already got this playbook where you don't have to start from scratch and get all the arrows in your back trying to pioneer it. You've already got somebody that's laid out a very clear path for you to reduce that risk. Maybe you've been only doing residential real estate, but you found a really fascinating commercial real estate opportunity where the franchise was really adding value and giving you a playbook. Yeah, no, I can see that. It makes sense. What What are some of the skill sets that you think go into being a successful franchise e-owner uh, versus the ones that don't make it? And I know we talked about not just listening to them, but I'm kind of curious as far as like breaking down the person, what does it mean to be a good operator? As you mentioned, it's so hard to paint a wide brush and say every single franchise brand needs this, right? Some are more sales heavy than others, but what I would say is general business acumen, right? So I'll give you an example. I had a guy that was the top former at his service business, but he didn't know how to write an estimate. So literally he's going there and he's doing all this business and all this volume, but he's losing money on every single job. The franchise was trying to teach him left, right. He just didn't have the financial acumen to make it work. Uh, so mm -hmm. that, that's one thing I would say, just general business acumen, HR, right? Vast majority of franchises have some employees. It might not be a lot, but still you need to be able to manage and inspire people. That, that would be another thing that I would say. And uh, just being a good business person. In general, being able to run the business and not yeah. have it run you. Yeah, or even no. better, I mean, the model that I have that's semi-absentee, you need to manage a manager, right? If you're going to have a day job and you got to be good at managing that manager. Yeah. Do you have any stories that come to mind on clients that I'm trying to think of like maybe there was like a successful story that you could tell and maybe like an unsuccessful story and then kind of what what went into each of those? Does any, sure, any particular clients in the past come to mind? Absolutely. Well, I, one that really comes to mind is that I just love businesses that have low employees. And I have things that are real estate related that don't have any employees at all. Um, it's a real estate play. Uh, it's specifically in the salon industry where you uh, go ahead and you kind of like we work for salons, right? Where you rent out space uh, and then you go ahead and sublease that space. And there's huge margins in it as well. Uh, so it's a situation where every single placement that I've known in this industry is doing well, uh, where they have huge uh, high occupancies. They're able to scale, uh, able to open up a few at a time, right? Or even more. One of my friends has 30 of these uh, here in Houston. Uh, it's just a really, really good business uh, that's scalable. Um, and I have one candidate that's just really doing very, very well. They actually bought real estate underneath. Uh, so they own the, the real estate, the dirt, and they own this as well. And so they've uh, go, went ahead and, and they've expanded this. 
Uh, the, the business that, that really that didn't go so well and it just feel bad about it is just kind of anyone that started in 2020 in things that were COVID related yeah. businesses. Yeah. I just feel so bad about those starts. Nothing that neither that any of us knew or could do, um, especially ones that were undercapitalized, even with the PPP money. That was very hard for me. Yeah. Gym business, restaurants, everyone took a hit. I'm curious. And the one that was a success, it's interesting. So I get my hair cut at place that you just described. Somebody leased out the commercial real estate in this building and basically chopped it up into a bunch of very tiny little offices. And it was specifically for salons. Like this person said, I'm going to take this real estate space. I'm going to create a bunch of cubbies and I'm going to outfit it in a way where there's like a sink in each one. Uh, but that's basically it. And it's all these salon people that, that cut hair in there is is that was that the model with the model finding real estate? Because it sounded like a real estate business at first glance when I just heard it, where they're taking a piece of uh, real estate and then sub chopping it up into sub leases and then renting that out. Or do they actually own the salons in those sub leasing and they're leasing the salons, or are they actually hiring the employees to to cut the hair and do it? I mean, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything there. So, Brandon, that's this model I'm telling you about is specifically where you don't own any of the salon businesses at all. Uh, you're either leasing the space or, or owning the dirt underneath, and you're renting out uh, sub offices to salon professionals or tattoo removal experts or eyelash extensia experts, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds like a real estate business, right? It is a I real mean, estate, but, but it, it, what's yeah. interesting, Brandon, is that. It is a real estate business that happens to be a franchise, just like a property management business might be. Yeah. But what's fascinating about it is, is that there's value that the franchisor is adding, right? People tend to underestimate how complicated it is to start a business from scratch, right? So I'm talking about things such as all these mistakes that you would make, If uh, how much are you going to charge uh, for the people? Are you going to go ahead and invoice them every two weeks because they're salon professionals every month? Uh, how are you going to market to them on Instagram? What's like the copy? How do you find them? All these different things are the accounting system. There's value that a good franchisor would provide for you in something like that. Huh, that's really interesting. Okay, so they don't actually own like the business itself, but they're subleasing it out to the people that want to operate and, and run that business. So they so they own the actual salon suite, right? Uh, but they're right. subleasing different uh, build uh, different sub buildings or, or different uh, to tenants that have their own business. Okay. And, and the, the tenants that have their own business, you mentioned like tattoo and salons and everything else. So they're not giving them the blueprint on like how to run a great tattoo business or how to no, run a great salon No, they're business. just saying, hey, Got this it. is how much this is per month. Pay me every two weeks, please. Got it. Okay. So it did it hard. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's almost like a, like a rental business. Really interesting. What is the structure that you're typically seeing with the franchisee and the franchisor as far as you know, compensation based on success, profit sharing, et cetera. So pretty standard in my industry where franchisees need to pay an ongoing royalty fee. It's anywhere from four to 20%. Kumon's fascinating in that it's very inexpensive again to Kumon, but they charge, I believe, 20% off the top, which is really, really steep, right? So uh, average in the, in the franchising world is probably eight to 10% or maybe 6%. And the question people need to ask is how much is going into my pocket, right? Is it fair or not? And the way you find that out is talking to other franchisees and seeing what their experience has been with the franchise brand. So just to put this in in focus, let's say you know the business is doing uh, you know revenue million million bucks a year. They're running twenty percent gross profit margin, so gross profit before your operating expenses about two hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, let's say that they're running a 50% net profit margin off that, right? So you know, 50% of growth is pretty good. So million bucks revenue, 20% uh, gross profit margin, $200,000 gross profit, and then they're able to take home about 100 k a year. How does that split break down with the franchisee in this hypothetical example? So what would happen is if it's a 4% royalty fee, which is on the low end, then you would only get 960 out of that 1 million. It comes from all your gross revenue off the top. So instead of making $100,000, it's just an example, right? You would make 60,000. And that's okay. not a good split. That's not fair to me. If you're, if you're putting all the work and they're taking out 40,000 or 40%, right? That's not a good situation. 
yeah, you're putting up all the the money. Um, you're yeah, you're you're running everything and that. Well, so what would be a good situation? What does a good split look like? You know, uh, in my opinion, as a franchisee, the lower the better, right? Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but you know, you have to understand this is their model as well. This is how they get paid, right? So it's got to be fair and equitable. Um, I think um, my opinion would be anywhere from ten to twenty percent. Of, of whatever your your amount is that would be acceptable for me um as long as it's as long as they're providing good value yeah so whatever you're taking home you're taking them 100 grand a year you're paying them out 10 twenty thousand dollars out of that for having everything kind of set up for you yeah, yeah. that that definitely seems fair for sure 100 percent what when you get like a new client who's interested in in this because i know there's uh, there's a ton of value in consulting and coaching i see the value in it right you definitely don't want the, the, i'd rather miss 10 good investments than make one bad investment and that's where consultants come in they help you make uh prevent you from making a bad investment how do you work with clients and add value in that respect if somebody wanted to come to you and say hey adam i want to hire you as a consultant to help me navigate these waters of purchasing a franchise, what does that relationship look like? So we start off with a kind of getting to know you quick chat where it's about 10 minutes or so. And I have them fill out a survey if they qualify. So I mentioned that the threshold is 50,000 in cash, $150,000 in net worth. That could include 401ks or IRAs. And then we have a more in-depth conversation because people think that they're buying a franchise, but what they really want is they want a partnership, right? So we talk for about an hour or so, getting to know one another. And then what I do is I go ahead and I see which brand, uh, even before I see which brands are available, I write a two-page letter or model where I'm not even worried about brand, but just more focused on characteristics of an ideal franchise for that candidate. Things such as how many employees they want, what kind of employees, how involved in business do they want to be. And then I go ahead and see which things are available in their territory that are the best fit. Because if I gave them 10, that would be probably too many. If I gave them mm -hmm. one, that would be too few. Three is kind of like the sweet spot. I want to give them things that are different than one another to kind of compare and contrast different business mm -hmm. models. And then they start their investigations directly with the franchise brand. And I'm there for every step of the way. Uh, and we just kind of together find the right fit. Who have you noticed this is a really good fit for? Is there a specific avatar that you've noticed this works really well for? Because there's a lot of people out there, there's maybe someone who's retired and they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm retired. I don't need to work for anybody anymore. You know, I'd like to uh, not have to figure something out and just have some passive income come in, in. you know, probably somebody who's, who's a bit older. Then there's guys who are like, I'm just sick of my corporate job. I want to do something else. <laughs> Uh, and then maybe there's some younger guys that are, you know, like out of school being like, you know, I don't really want to go to the corporate route. Uh, and then there's people that want to, you know, diversify and be like, I don't want my eggs all in in this one basket I've got over here in, in my business. You know, maybe they're entrepreneurs. Have you noticed this uh, like a specific avatar that this is good for? Look, all of the people you talked about, not just one, right? I have the retirees that are just kind of that have more in the tank. Are not ready to quit, right? But have somehow been shoved aside by corporate America. I have people that are in the middle of their career that are looking for an exit plan or a side hustle. I have people that are younger that don't want to join the co uh, corporate rat race, right? What I found is that after the pandemic, people kind of figured out how life is like without having to work, kind of working on their own terms, maybe working from home or flexible work. And they realized they kind of want to be work. Uh, um, at work by themselves, but in the franchising world, they don't have to be alone. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing any trends in the franchisee space, like more more franchises going maybe like online or offline, or maybe the brick and mortar business is picking up, or maybe there's a specific uh, niche that you've noticed that's uh, really doing well compared to others? Such a great question. So look, what I did notice is the pandemic for obvious reasons, kind of put a kibosh on brick and mortar businesses. And yeah. that just took a couple of years to kind of recover. I found that we still have great people interested in non brick and mortar businesses and service companies. Mm -hmm. I think such mosquito spraying, like I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but we're also seeing with the economy just getting stronger right now. No one's talking about recessions anymore. Cyclical businesses getting excited, uh, having a lot of interest and excitement again. So it's 
really an interesting time for franchises in that I have brick and mortar and non brick and mortar businesses that are doing really, really well. I think the trend is health and wellness in general. Yeah. People are getting very, very excited about that. And we talk about health and wellness. I'm not only talking about a gym per se, but I'm talking about things related to mental health or things that are related to uh, wellness or metabolic health, right? I mean, just th anything related to that category, I think is a very strong one that's not going away anywhere. Interesting. Tell me more about these health and wellnesses or non gym related. My wife, she works for a, uh, uh, it's a, it's like a, uh, what is it? Six one five health and wellness. Like literally, I think it has the words health and wellness in it. And you know, they're doing a ton of uh, IVs. You know, she came on to do the aesthetic side, so you know, a lot of Botox, a lot of filler, a lot of uh, let's make you beautiful and feel feel young and young again. What are some of those other like health and wellness businesses that are doing well? Like what products and services? So, so Brandon, I'm a huge sports fan, right? And I see Hims advertisements come on, uh, meaning, hey, get your testosterone shot in the mail and, and do this. And I'm thinking really it's better to have this in four walls, like with a hospitality type mindset. Yeah. And so when I'm talking about wellness, I'm, I'm talking about the gym and things of that sort, right? But I'm also talking about things uh, such as IV drips or testosterone or cold plunges, right? Yeah. Um, anything related to that, or it could be something related to women's health. Um, it could be something, uh, for instance, it, it could be the um, tan uh, or get tanning. I mean, I know tanning was kind of the spray tan thing is not, but yeah. there's new ways to actually do that. Or it could be things related to aesthetics or waxing. Mm -hmm. um, you name it, there are all these different things in that. I want to add one caveat as well. Another industry that I really like, the whole idea of experiential brands. Um, a lot of brands, if you think about them, it's an experience. Chick-fil-A is an experience, right? Yeah, yeah. And that could be in different things as well, right? So uh, things such as a mobile food concept that people get excited about or uh, soap and body works, right? Or something related to art. Um, everyone's heard of these different sip and paint franchises that are only uh, adult related Imagine mm -hmm. if you have something that's a better concept that kind of attracts kids as well. That's really interesting. The whole thing that's experiential is fascinating in franchising as well. Wow. So there's a ton of opportunities out there. What do you think is driving the health and wellness space? I think we have an aging population, right? We call it a silver tsunami, right? Yeah, the baby boomers. And not only baby boomers, but the people behind the echo boomers, right? I mean, just I just think that people are not getting any younger. They have disposable income. Yeah. They want to kind of age gracefully. And I think you, you have this. I mean, look, Ozempic, right? I mean, everyone's talking about it. It's kind of like this huge wave. Everyone wants to look better. I mean, I have friends who take Ozempic, right? Just recreationally. I mean, there's all it, it's it, there's no stigma anymore to all these different health related things. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that the silver tsunami. I mean, it's a big thing. It's going to completely change everything, especially down the road. When I think I've saw statistics that like at least a quarter of our population in the next twenty years is going to be over like 65, 70 years old, which is crazy because you know they've got most of the money and they're going to have a significant portion of the buying power, which is going to influence which businesses thrive and which ones don't. I love what you said about Chick-fil-A because it's so funny. I remember when someone told me this, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. You're so right. I think that in order to thrive in today's economy as a business, you have to be able to deliver a good experience because we make emotional decisions, not rational decisions. And somebody said, you know, why do you go to Chick-fil-A? And I was like, oh, you know, it's really good chicken. And they're like, it's not why you go to Chick Fil A. And I was like, well, you're right. Okay, I, I know that if I see a long line, I'm going to get in and out really quick. And they're like, that's not why you go either. I'm like, all right, well, why do I go then? They go because of the way it makes you feel. I said, what do you mean? I go, when you walk into a McDonald's, do you remember the last McDonald's you walked in? And I'm like, dude, I can't even remember the last McDonald's. I was like, well, oh, right. And I said, okay, um, yeah, they had the pl like they had the the plastic screens up there. This was before they remodeled it, and they had the vi you know the videos showing the burgers and everything. It was literally like little slips that they would twist, and it would kind of like change. So it was like old plastic uh, signage in there, and it was just like very very old, and you know it smelled really greasy. And he's like, "How did that make you feel?" I was like, it "Felt gross." That is exactly how I felt walking in him. I felt gross at the time. And he goes, "How do you feel walking into Chick Fil A?" I go, 
I don't feel gross. They got new flowers everywhere. The lights are really nice. The staff say my pleasure. Uh, it's like hustle and, and bustle. They've got uh, neat uh, photos on the wall of everybody. I was like, no kidding. He's like, because the Chick-fil-A food's not any more healthy for you than McDonald's. Let's be honest. But the experience that they give you going through everything, you know, getting that food, that's the reason that they buy. So I love that you said that. I'm curious if somebody wants to learn more about franchising opportunities, if they want to learn more about you. I know you've got a book as well. Like, where can they go to learn more information? Best place is just go straight to my website. It's franchisecoach.net. You'll see a button there to book a time. Let's just have a chat, right? I'm here to educate. As My service is free. And let's just kind of see if we're a good fit for each other. So you're okay. So that's an important note. So this, this is a free service. You don't charge anything for it. If I make a successful match, it's the franchise brand that pays us a commission. So literally people have got no risk whatsoever reaching out to you. Zero risk at all. Okay. And I, right. I promise if I don't think you're a good fit, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> that's good to know. You'll save a lot of people a lot of headache from getting into something that probably they shouldn't have gotten in with the beginning. So, well, heck, man, I mean, that that that's a no-brainer. If you guys are interested in franchising, definitely reach out to Adam and learn more. Adam, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much, Brandon. Yeah, and if you're listening to this, do us a favor. If you got value from this, leave us a review and share with your friends and family. Till next time.